It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Excited about the folks that are on the mountain praying. And uh, pray they just have had an amazing, amazing weekend. It's great to welcome you all online. And uh, so excited about what God is doing uh, in your lives. Uh, praying for Beth Paps today that had uh, uh, unexpected surgery yesterday. Beth, if you're watching, uh, just pray that God's presence will be close to you. It's also a joy to welcome uh, Rick and uh, Joy uh, this morning here. Uh, Rick and Joy Prince. And um, Rick uh, needs to sell a house in Rollins so he can move to Buffalo. And uh, so uh, about uh, three, four months ago, we announced that uh, Rick would be coming and Joy would be mo moving to Buffalo to, to join our staff. And uh, Pastor Rick is uh, uh, going to be working in the area of discipleship. And so... Uh, Rick, good to see you, and uh, get up here this summer, huh? And uh, he will be with us on the 30th for Grab a Shovel Weekend. Everybody grab a shovel, because we're going to put it in the ground. Amen. And it'll be fun, and um, it'll be a great time, great time together. Mark 16, and I uh, want to continue talking about uh, the resurrection a little bit. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene... Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away? Ask that with me, will you? Who will roll the stone away? One more time. Who will roll the stone away? away from the entrance of the tomb. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. They entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in white, a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be afraid or alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He was who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. You will see him just as he told you. You know, all of us know about resurrection but my prayer is, is that we would experience resurrection, that we would come to know that, not just in our heads, but in our hearts, because resurrection is powerful. We talked last week about the crucifixion, because the crucifixion, man, we thank God that it's finished there and that our sins were forgiven. But as powerful as the crucifixion is and was, the resurrection is even more powerful because with one we have forgiveness of sins, but with the other we have life and we have life more abundantly. I'll never forget uh, the time I was at the, at the garden tomb and uh, I saw a picture of me at the garden tomb and I thought, man, my pride won't allow me to show that to you. But uh, check, this, uh, check this one out. This is the, the stone. Now I'm positive that isn't the original stone. Um, that was rolled away, but it was a big stone. Let me give you some scale of how big the stone would have been. Uh, give me the next one, because this is the opening of the garden tomb. That's my friend Alicia coming out. And you can see where the trough would have been right just underneath that top step. That would have been one big honking stone to have rolled away from the tomb. And so no wonder the ladies were saying, Who's going to roll the stone away? It wasn't like they were going to come and pick it up and move it because it had been, gravity had rolled it down and rolled it in place so it would be going against gravity to go back uphill to be away from that big, probably six foot opening. So we're dealing with a very large six foot stone. I remember going through that door and going in to see the tomb and it was interesting um, that far right is kind of a, a channel there through which you walk in. And then on, 
or the far left rather, the right is probably up about this high. And, um, you know, that would have been where the body would have been laying. And so the Bible says the angel was sitting there. I know that when I was in there, it was so powerful. Have, has anybody here been in that tomb? Yeah, you guys have been. Awesome. And um, by the way, everybody was. Everybody was. Yeah. These guys, and we were there physically, but everybody was. And there was something about it I would have loved to have hung out in there. I mean, I've seen tombs in places like New Orleans and Guatemala that are creepy. And, uh, but that, that tomb wasn't creepy. It was like peace in this place. And it would have been awesome had there not been a line waiting to get in. I would have loved to have hung out in there a bit. Because there was something about, this is where my Savior laid. And he isn't there. He, I wouldn't have been in there if he had been there. But he was, he was there physically. You understand what I'm meaning. He was there spiritually. But wow, that was, that was the tomb. So they're asking the question, who's going to roll the stone away? Now, I want to tell you this morning, the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let us see in. Because... Had it not been rolled away, we wouldn't have believed what we would know and what would come to pass that he is not here, but he is risen. I'd like to suggest this morning that that stone and who's going to roll it away is a question that most of us also ask in our lives. Who's going to roll the stone away? Who's going to move it in my life? Because the stone represents a barrier. The stone represents something that's holding something back. The stone is something that's holding something in. And so we would ask the question, who's going to move the barrier? Who's going to set us free? Who's going to be the one? I think there are five kinds of stones that need rolled away in our lives. I know there's four in the notes, but I'm going to give you a fifth one. And it's simply this. The first one would be the stone of a painful past. Who's going to roll the stone away of a painful past? Now, we won't spend much time here because we talked about this last week. But the fact of it is, is Jesus doesn't really care much about your past. He does understand the pain of it and wants to heal the wounds of it. But Jesus is interested in your future He's visited your future, and he wants to bless you. Some of us define our lives by our past. Look at what Isaiah 38, 17 says. We we visited this last Sunday. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. Uh, In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins. Somebody say, "All all my sins. You have put all my sins behind your back. In other words, when you come to him and you want to talk to him about your past, they're behind his back. He's not focused on your past, no matter how painful it was. He's focused on your future and he can take your past and instead of it working against you, it works for you. Instead of it being your enemy, it becomes your friend. Instead of it being your weakness, it becomes your strength. The second thing I would have you note is who's going to roll the stone away, the stone of past and present resentments. Who's going to roll the stone away? Now, a resentment is when we believe that somebody has offended us or we believe that we have been treated unfairly or, and in some cases we have been, but other cases we think we have been, which is just the same. And so we we struggle with deep resentment. And I want to tell you, the only way to navigate resentment is to get into the tomb and to see the living Christ, to see the resurrection, to see what he can do in you and through you and for you. Resentment is not your friend. In fact, resentment is very often our taking God's place and say, I'm going to punish someone because we don't, we don't think this or believe it, but we think God isn't going to do it to my satisfaction, and so I need to do it for him. 
And so we carry around this root of resentment and it's holding us back and that stone needs to be rolled away so that we can walk in newness of life, so that we can walk in spiritual victory. Are you tracking with me? The third one would be the stone of perpetual problems. Do you ever have a problem that just doesn't seem to go away? I mean, all of us have had those. Some of them may be physical, some of them may be otherwise, but a, a, a stone of perpetual problem. You know, uh, some of us uh, look at our, the perpetuality, is that a word? The perpetuality of our, it is now, uh, of, our, of our problems. And we go, well, that's just because that's all I know. Well, that may be true. Some of us act out the way we act because it's the only way we know how to act. And we, we, we also excuse things. Well, I was born in Nebraska. That's where I was born. And um, I was born in Nebraska, so I am the, I'm a cornhusker. I am the way I am. By the way, I was six months when they moved from there, so <laughs> this, is just, this is just totally hypothetical. Or, or I was born Italian, and that's just the Italians talk loud. Or I was born redheaded, and that's why I have a temper. Or I was, I was born Irish, and that's what Irish do. And so we excuse a lot of the propensities of our lives and some of those become self-fulfilling prophecies that we just repeat over and over. And I would like to suggest Jesus wants to roll that stone away. Amen. Now, Psalm 51 is so powerful because David is praying, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What is the difference between iniquity and sin? Sin is when I do something that I shouldn't have done. I trespass. Here's a line. I'm stepping over into somebody else's property or I'm stepping into a place that I'm not supposed to be. And of course, if I sometimes I step over a line and don't realize I stepped over the line until somebody comes along and says, hey, you've trespassed. Well, when they say you've trespassed, if you say, well, I don't care, your land is my land, you know, then we've moved into a transgression where I'm like, um, I'm going to do what I'm going to do no matter what you say. And so then I've got a, a deeper problem. But what is the word iniquity? Iniquity means crooked. It means the path of my life has some way grown crooked. And iniquity is tied to what it was that caused me to do the sin, which is why David is saying, cleanse me, wash away my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin because those aren't the same. Sin is what I did. Iniquity is what made me do it. I know um, this would really date me, but some of you remember Flip Wilson who said the devil made me do it, right? Well, the devil didn't make you do anything because he has no power in your life that you don't give him. And so wash away my iniquity. Iniquity is my crookedness, my propensity to do sin. Isaiah says the Similar thing, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. How many of you know sometimes your own way is what got you in trouble? And so we have gone to turn to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, what? The crookedness, the iniquity of us all. And I'd like to suggest to you today that Jesus wants to roll away the stone of perpetual problems. Some of the problems that have been giving you fits for years, he not only wants to forgive it, but he wants to cleanse it so that it's no longer perpetual in your life. Amen. He rolls the stone away. Hang out in the tomb. You'll see he's not there. He's come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The fourth thing I'd have you note 
is he wants to roll away this stone of perplexing self-doubts. Perplexing self-doubts. Now, many of us have been given so much encouragement and so much positive feedback, it makes no sense that we have self-doubt. And yet the enemy comes along and says, you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be good enough. You'll never be strong enough. You'll never be smart enough. You'll never be fill in the blank. And so we have these perplexing self-doubts. And I want to tell you today, Jesus wants to roll away the stone of every inferiority complex. He wants to roll the stone away that I'll never be good enough. I love the story of the two ladies that saw the sign at the travel agency and this beautiful tropical scene. And it says, get away from the mundane, the boring, and the dry. And one says, man, we should go. And the other one says, well, it would be okay to go, except that the mundane, the dry, and the boring would go with us. (laughs) And she says, what do you mean, your husband? Know me. Know me. Because wherever I go, I take me with me. Oh, man. I'm telling you, Jesus loves you so much. Stop giving ear to the enemy that you're not enough. And that you have self-doubt. I'm telling you, if God is for you, who can be against you? I'm saying if God is for you, Everybody else might as well be too. And there's victory in Jesus. Well, it's not in your notes, but let me give you one more. And that would be the stone of dullness spiritually. The stone of dullness spiritually. Do you ever feel really dull? You feel like a knife trying to cut a piece of bread and it won't even cut through the bread and you just kind of feel like You are dull. Turn to somebody near you and say, you're not dull. (laughs) No, you're not. But look at at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Here's the root of it. What we have received is not the spirit of the world. It is the spirit of the world that makes you feel dull. It's the spirit of the world that makes you feel used. It's the spirit of the world that makes you feel like you don't have a cutting edge or a sharp edge spiritually. So what we've received is not the spirit of the world. Say that with me. What we've received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Now, if you're listening to only what the world says about you? Look at the last part of the verse. So that we may understand what God has freely given us. Here's the problem with dullness of spirit. Dullness of spirit will keep you from understanding all that he paid for you, all that he's freely given you. And so... I'm going to tell you he wants to roll the stone of dullness away from us so that we're not letting the world define us. We're letting the spirit define us because if the spirit defines us, then I can understand what God has freely given me. Well, let me, that was the introduction. Some of you thought, man, he's almost done. Well, let me give you some more stuff here. First of all, a key point. Jesus is risen from the dead so that you can experience barriers and stones being rolled away. Yeah, he's risen from the dead so that you can experience every barrier, every stone rolled away. So when the stone is rolled away, what happens? Let me give you three things. The first one is this. When the stone is moved on earth, as it is in heaven, is no longer just a prayer, but it's a present reality. It's not just a prayer. It's a present reality. 
your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Because the stone is rolled away and because the tomb is empty. When you pray that, you know that it's about to become your reality. Because his kingdom is coming into your life to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think according to his power that's in you. So what happened? What happened when the grave became empty? Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. Well, when I step into resurrection, look at what the Bible says happens. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 6, for he raised us, say that, he raised us. Say it again. He raised us from the dead along with Christ. Now, that's good news, right? Amen. But here's the better news. And he seated us with him. Come on. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Which is why I say your kingdom come, your will be done is more than just a prayer. It starts becoming my reality because I have not only been raised with him, but I am seated with him as well. And so I need to pray for him up there. I need to think from up there and I need to trust him for blessings from there even while I live here. Which means because I'm seated there, I'm a citizen somewhere else. I have dual citizenship. Amen. So on earth as it is in heaven. Now let me give you, give you the second thing. The second thing is when the stone is moved, baptism, it almost seems like I'm introducing another subject, but I'm not. Baptism is not just a ritual, but it's a powerful testimony of resurrection power. We have worked hard to get communion out of being a religious thing. I hope you take communion in your home and that you celebrate his death and victory for your life. But baptism also needs to be more than just some religious exercise that we do because we do it. It is being united with Christ in his death, but also in his victory. When we take somebody down in the water, we're saying, I believe in the death and the burial. He, was, he, was, he, needed, he needed to stay under a little longer. <laughs> but I also believe in the resurrection. resurrection. So baptism is a testimony of the resurrection. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 6, chapter 6, verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the, to the glory of God the Father, we may also live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Isn't that a cool verse? I'm united with him in death, but I'm united with him in life. So that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Speaking of perpetual problems. I'm set free from, from that. Now, when Jesus was baptized, we remember what happened. A voice comes out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Some of you new believers are going to hear that from him too. In your spirit, this is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I was out on the um, property praying um, yesterday morning about 6 o'clock and I was down by Cemetery Creek 
and I was listening to the water running on Cemetery Creek, and it really hit me. Cemetery Creek, that would be a really cool place to be baptized. Because I'm leaving my past in the cemetery. Hello? I'm, 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 I'm leaving, I'm burying it. Which he says that's what happens in baptism. I'm united with him in a death like his so that I can be united with him in a life like his. I have a feeling that we're going to be baptizing people all summer long. You better get up here, Rick. Because you're going to get wet. I've been saying that we're going to trust God to baptize 100 people this summer. And a few people look at me like that can't happen. Well, even if I'm wrong, what's wrong with believing it? And wouldn't it be amazing to step into that? Now, you understand baptism doesn't save anybody. You know, if I'm not saved, I just go down a dry center and I come up a wet one. Okay, so that, that doesn't help me. But man, if I'm saved, I am uniting with a death like his and coming up to live in a resurrection like his. And this is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. So I was, somebody says, baptized as a baby. Well, that's awesome. But do you remember that? Was that something your parents did for you? Or is that something that you remember? If you don't remember it, you had nothing to do with it. It was an act of your parents. Baptism, because God has no grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. Translated, I can't get to heaven based on my mom and daddy and their faith, I got to have my own. And so baptism becomes a testimony that I've got my own faith. It's not just my daddy's faith. It's not just my mama's faith. Now, I would suggest to you, if you were baptized as a baby, ask Holy Spirit if you should be baptized. And if he says, yes, let's get you wet this summer. Okay, pastor, okay. What about if I was a kid and I didn't even know what it was about? Is there any reason I couldn't be baptized again? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No reason in the whole wide world. Because it's not a religious thing. It's a, it's a thing to be united with him in his death and in his resurrection so that I may walk with him in fresh power and fresh strength. Well, somebody say amen. amen. That was pretty weak, but I'll take it. Number three. Number three, when the stone is moved, Jesus will bust through any locked door in order to give you peace. He will bust through any locked door to give you peace. Did I mention to you that the stone wasn't rolled away to let him out? It might, he might have been out before the stone was rolled away. I don't think he was behind the stone going, knock, knock. Who's there? So this is a great passage in John 20, and this may have been a week later on the evening of that first day of the week. When the disciples were together with the doors locked, somebody say with the doors locked, the doors locked. for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Doesn't say the door came unlocked. Did I ever mention that Jesus can just walk through locked doors? There's no door lock on your life that he can't bust right through and give you his peace. And he says to them, peace be with you. 
And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord again. The Lord, rather. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. I've preached this before and mentioned this before. Jesus gave them peace twice. I'm guessing that if somebody walks through a locked door that doesn't get opened and he says, peace, you might not have peace (laughs) the first time. You might go, ah. (laughs) And so he says it again at the point of he's shown them his hands because now they're ready to receive peace. And he says, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. You may feel all locked up. You may feel like there is battles you're struggling with that there's no way through. And I'm telling you that Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But I'm pretty sure if you're on the inside of that door, even if he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, if for some reason you were unable to open that door, but you desperately wanted to, he'd bust right through it and get to you. Because you, him giving you peace is what he's all about. And just as the angel was sitting on the raised section of the tomb and said, don't be afraid, Jesus comes and says, don't be afraid. I'm the one who opens every door. I'm the one that opens doors that no one can shut. I am the one who moves the stone away. And that's true of people sitting in Buffalo, Wyoming this morning. And it's true of people watching from all over. Philippians chapter 3 is a great passage. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, So that one way or another, isn't that a good phrase? One way or another. Say that with me. One way or another. Say it again. One way or another. I will experience the resurrection from the dead. He wants me not only to know the resurrection. He wants me to experience the resurrection. And he experiences the resurrection by moving the stone away. I want to pray for your worship team. Come on up. Father, I thank you for your favor, your blessing, your mercy, and your goodness. I pray for everyone online and everyone here that if there's a stone that needs rolled away, that today would be the day that that stone would be moved that stone would be taken out from the front of that tomb so that you could bring peace, that you could bring joy. Whether it's a perpetual problem, whether it's self-doubt, whether it's dullness of spirit, or whether it's my past, Jesus, roll the stone away. If that's you right now, would you just pray those words, Jesus, Roll the stone away. Wow, I can't believe how God is just moving in unprecedented ways. And he's speaking a fresh word. And I can tell that uh, the online folks are just praying for us. And uh, we just 
don't we count it such a privilege to be able to come into your home and to serve you in this kind of way your comments your likes your your words back to us your giving when you click on give makes such a huge difference to us they're encouraging uh, to my own heart i hope you just keep telling people about what's going on in buffalo wyoming because it's strategic god's moving in unprecedented ways and i just believe there's going to be an anointing that travels onto every person that watches and that god's word is going to make such a difference in your lives in the days ahead no we're praying for you too and we love it that you're part of the grace family